And gentlemen, you are live. Welcome to Ask the Supervisor. I'm Matt Lowndes here with Town Supervisor Peter Van Skoyak. Today is Monday, October 4th. And we are here to talk about East Hampton. Of course, Peter, how was your weekend? Oh, it was great. You know, the big largest clam contest was on Sunday. Uh, we had some beautiful weather. Uh, it used to be a fall event. Now it seems more like a summer event, given the, the temperature of the last three years. It used to be nippy and cold, and you'd want that cup of warm chatter to keep your hands warm. But uh, now it's like summertime still, I guess, uh, one of the effects of uh, in climate change. It was cold on Thursday, Friday, and then this weekend it was beautiful. Just beautiful, um, right? It really was. I was outside power washing for a little bit. It was a beautiful weekend. Um, and if you have any questions, you could dial in on the number above or email me at mattlowns at ltveh.org. That's M-A-T-T-L-O-W-N-E-S. Uh, so feel free to call in whenever you like. Peter, let's start off with the uh, affordable housing, proposed affordable housing unit on uh, Three Mile Harbor, the 50 unit Um apartment complex that could be put up at some point there was a town meeting about that i believe last week on the 22nd and yeah uh, there would have been a planning board meeting i believe yeah yeah and um there seems to be some public opinion on both ends many people want it but some are worried about whether it be um a waste issue water issue or gas issue and a traffic issue I'm worried about uh too many people in the area, too much development over there. What's your opinion on the 50-unit uh, complex on Three Mile Harbor? Well, I think all of those concerns are legitimate and need to be looked at. Uh, but we also know that we've had a crisis for housing affordability, which has only gotten uh, exponentially more difficult since the pandemic started with the influx of people from outside the area buying up real estate, driving prices even higher, and basically almost eliminating the year round rental market. Uh, you know, our crisis has gotten even worse. Um, and why does it matter? Uh, it matters because every sector of town, whether it's private businesses, uh, the school districts, the town municipality itself are all having trouble hiring and retaining staff due to the housing affordability issues. We have uh, volunteer fire departments. We have volunteer ambulance corps. Um, and, and in my opinion, there's nothing better than volunteer fire departments and ambulance corps. These people uh, serve their community for the sake of the community uh, and not for, not for money. And you can't get better care than that. Um, maintaining the fabric of our community, the history, the traditions, all of that, uh, get stripped away if we have a complete turnover of housing within the town. We need to maintain our diversity, and that means that uh, we have to figure out ways to uh, continue to provide affordable housing, housing affordability, really. Um, you know, it used to be it was just low-income families that uh, were in need of this type of housing. Now it's anyone uh, who actually works within town. I mean, there's virtually no way you could afford to buy a house uh, working on the local economy anymore. It's just really almost completely out of reach now. Um, and, you know, we need to address it. So I, I understand the concerns of folks in the neighborhood uh, and the desire not to overburden a neighborhood or the town. And certainly we need to make sure any development uh, does not negatively impact our groundwater. Um, you know, we need to have state-of-the-art treatment of, uh, of wastewater. Um, but at the same time, it's critically important uh, to maintain that diversity in our community. Yeah, and I talked to uh, Tom Rule two weeks ago. He's the Director of Community and Housing Development uh, for the town of East Hampton. And he was very passionate about the fact that your generation needs to think about the future generations and the lo specifically the locals living out here and working out here or else there won't be volunteer firemen. There won't be volunteer EMTs. Um, and this is more of just a, an opinion question, but what do you say, whether it be the, the affordable housing or the 
cell tower or the airport. What do you say to the people who, who use, use the uh, term NIMBY, not in my backyard? Because if everybody keeps saying that, then nothing's ever going to get developed in anyone's backyard. So how do you, if someone were to say that to you, not in my backyard, how do you, how, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, first of all, it's really important to gauge, engage the, the local community uh, on any kind of um, proposed development or project or whatever it is and have a discussion, open discussion, sometimes just discussing the issue uh, people, uh, I guess, misunderstand that, you know, this is our process from hearing from the public. And then, you know, we have to basically judge uh, on rational criteria as to what the benefits and detriments are of anything uh, that's proposed. And, you know, I spent a lot of time, 11 years on the local zoning board of appeals. I was chair of that board, um, went on to the planning board, spent six years on the planning board reviewing land use applications. And there's always a balancing test that you have to perform. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, acknowledging people's concerns and really looking at them and then seeing, you know, you have to make a decision for the overall benefit of the community. Um, you know, that's the weighing test is the detriment uh, to the community versus the benefit to the overall community. How does the, how does that assessment you know play out? Um, so you know I think it's understandable also when people fear some sort of change or proposal. So it's it's critically important to really strip away um, you know irrational fears, get to what the real concerns are, and try to address those. I will say that you know uh, when we proposed a housing affordable housing overlay district here at 395 Panago Road, where the town has acquired 12 acres for development of affordable housing, mm -hmm. the neighbors weighed in and, you know, they contacted us with their concerns. And, you know, I think, honestly, we can work directly with those neighbors uh, to address those concerns in a way that will make that project, you know, um, compatible with the neighborhood and acceptable by the neighbors. You know, I think it's important to have what those legitimate concerns are. And, and frankly, I was really encouraged uh, by the rational uh, and legitimate questions that were raised. And, and the, you know, that way you can have a dialogue and you can work through and figure out, you know, what the best, best way forward is. So, you know, yeah. it's important. Nobody can concerned. deny Nobody can deny that we need more affordable housing out here. I mean, that's just, it's pretty evident as far as, uh, you know, I think Tom Rule told me something along the lines of in the 90s, or maybe it was you, in the 90s, 90% 90 of the teachers were living in the uh, district, and now it's down to like 10%. So um, that's something that everybody should care about, in my opinion, and uh, it's something to keep an eye on in the future. Moving on, yeah. though, or yeah. unless you had any last thoughts. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, moving on, you have about. you have a uh, town board meeting tomorrow, and you, you, it's I'll just flip, defer the floor to you, Peter, about what you would like to talk about next. Well, uh, tomorrow we'll be discussing my tentative budget, the 2022 uh, town budget. And, um, you know, that's uh, that's a lengthy process every year. I meet with every single department head, and we discuss – the operations of their department. Um, we talk about what uh, they see as ongoing needs and whatnot. And, um, you know, we do our very best to stay underneath the uh, state mandated 2% tax cap. Uh, that is an arbitrary number and uh, it requires a great deal of uh, careful planning and work to maintain that budget under 2%, keeping in mind that uh, in any given year, we have a number of contractual and mandated increases in expenditures. The, this year, over $700,000 in retirement contributions alone for all our many employees. Um, and so it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, I'm presenting a budget that meets that challenge. It's about uh, 80, 85 million, just a, about 85.3 million in spending. In the major funds, um, it's about a $2.6 million increase 
And uh, but the the residential the impact on residential taxes is is really pretty minimal. We stay below, as I said, the tax cap on a one point two million dollar house. It's at roughly sixty dollars of increase. Uh, keep in mind that we, since the pandemic, particularly, we've seen a great deal of growth in our year round population. Uh, you know, we used to benefit from just having a lot of second homes that were unoccupied for 10 months of the year or more. Um, and now many of those homes are being occupied year round, which means the demand for services year round increases. Uh, we find that as we talked about housing affordability is an issue, uh, people being able to make ends meet um, becomes more difficult for those local folks, uh, many of whom are town employees or employed in local businesses. And, um, you know, I think we really need to be looking forward, although I've proposed a budget that stays under the 2% tax cap. Uh, again, that's pretty much an arbitrary number, which I think um, if we continue to try to stay under that cap, uh, we will see a real erosion of the town's ability to provide the services that are demanded by the public and to be able to hire and retain staff given those other pressures of either uh, local housing being uh, unavailable or expensive uh, and the challenges geographically uh, given one road in and one road out of, of commuting uh, transportation uh, is really over is really another key factor here. So, you know, I am going to ask the board I'm presenting a budget that stays below the 2% tax cap uh, but I, I'm encouraging the board to take a look at some specific areas, primarily uh, increasing the pay for municipal employees. Um, even though we've recently uh, settled a CSEA contract, um, I think now that we've had a chance to really go through the budget and understand where we are and where we're going to be, that uh, further review of pay for town employees uh, should take place. Uh, we do propose a number of regrades and promotions within this budget. We do um, add additional funding to hire more police officers and uh, another ordinance inspector. I think um, we really should be looking to have even more hirees going forward. Uh, is there again, to keep up there, with the demands? Is there? Uh... Is there reasons that you could provide that can let people know why we want to hire another uh, more police officers and more ordinance directors? Um, so again, you know, we've always tried to adjust the budget to reflect uh, the needs and demands of the community. And while we had a lot of people here in the summer, the off season relatively quiet, and so you know, town employees, uh, the budget's been adjusted to that with an increasing number of people being here year round. Uh, there's more demand for, for, um, for services. And that, okay. that's everything from the sanitation department, uh, human services department, highway across the board. You know, right. there's and much more traffic on the local roadways. They require uh, more frequent maintenance and repaving given the amount of traffic they're receiving. And so we need to look out just beyond where we are now. We've maintained a AAA credit rating again um, for the fourth year in a row, actually fifth year in a row, but for those years um, during my term. And that's allowed us to be able to borrow money at a very inexpensive rate for capital projects. But you can't use uh, you know, capital borrowing or surplus is not a good idea for recurring expenses. So we have to address that somehow. Uh, I have made a suggestion that we should investigate a local sales tax to help um, offset some of the costs of hosting visitors to our community in the summertime, uh, whether that be, you know, hotel bed tax, hospitality tax. So we're looking into that as a, as a possible source of revenue, non-property tax revenue. Now, just for clarification purposes, um, 
because I don't know, and, and maybe a viewer at home may not understand. Are you allowed to go over that 2%? Yes, yeah, so it requires a majority vote of the town board to break the cap, uh, which in, in this particular case is three votes, uh, which is, is a simple majority. You need that there, to do anything. Is there repercussions for going over the 2% or it's just saying that this year we went over the 2%? It, I mean, the rep, repercussions are that people's tax bills uh, will go up somewhat, depending on how much over. Uh, okay. Taxes go up every year, uh, but have been capped at 2%. This, this particular year, I'm, I'm delivering a tentative budget that stays below the 2% tax cap uh, by about $5,000. That's how closely shaped wow. out of yeah. $5 million budget. Uh, there's really only about 5000 in cap space. Uh, and again, you know, I think uh, in order to be able to field a highway department, to field code enforcement, um, et cetera. And, and again, we know that uh, the year round population is increasing, whether people like it or not. Um, there's no more real estate, really. I mean, we've had, we have had some new homes built, but when you look at the number of people who who've come out year round versus the number of new properties. There's a, there's a big difference of disparity there. So it's not so much that our tax base has grown as the population demanding services is growing. So we'll need to, we'll need to take that in consideration and, and uh, plan for that. Now, I guess as a follow up, my question to you is, you know, after nine 11, there was a mini exodus People came out here for a little bit long term and then they went back to the city. Have you heard or do you expect the long term residents to go back down over the next few years? Or you really the town doesn't have any expectations because it's a because it's because of COVID? Well, that's the sixty four million dollar question. I guess yeah. in this case, the eighty five million dollar question. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I don't really know. I suspect that the world has changed enough that many people. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Many people have um, learned that they can, um, you know, work remotely. That because of that, they would rather live out here, given you know the high quality of life that we enjoy, proximity to the water and natural surroundings. So I I don't think we're going to see pre-pandemic populations year round. And, and I think there was a trend more towards uh, year round living or at least expanded season living here in town for the last couple of years. You know, September has a lot more people around the last several years than we used to. It used to be as soon as school started, you know, Tumbleweed Tuesday was almost like a ghost town. It was such a remarkable change overnight. It's true. But now, you know, there's a lot going on, shoulder seasons, a lot more reasons for people to be around uh, here, um, whether it's the film festival, Falls Festival, um, you know, you, you name it. The weather's been getting warmer. Uh, September's been warmer. It used to be, you know, the third week in September, you'd expect things to start chilling down. And by, you know, this time in October, many of the leaves are starting to change. And certainly by Halloween, all the leaves will be gone. Yeah. Um, two years ago, there wasn't even a, a brown leaf yet. Uh, Halloween came and everything was still green. It had been extremely warm October. So that seems to be the trend. That's what scientists are telling us we can expect. The shoulder seasons are expanding. More people can work remotely. Uh, so there, there you have it. All right. So tomorrow at your meeting, you're going to start off with the uh, budget. And then is there any other main issues you'd like to talk about? You know, about there, there are a couple other announcements I would like to make. Yeah, cool. Um, I, I, you know, I we did... have, um, we've been seeking to expand uh, testing here um, because of the demand recently for COVID testing. Uh, so we've added a, another site, a third site in town, the uh, East Hampton Center for Humanity, formerly known as the CDCH, where we gave vaccinations um, throughout much of the late winter, early spring yep. uh, to the beginning of summer. And, um, you know, so we'll be offering in, uh, with our partners, Care One Concierge uh, 
free testing at that location on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 10 to 6 p.m. Okay. And uh, that would be a PCR um, saliva test. It's not as okay. invasive as the nasal swab. Um, and again, there's no charge for that. And you can pre-register or you can go as a walk-up. Uh, there are no rapid tests available at this time. Uh, that may be added uh, coming up soon when those tests become available. There's such demand for them now. I think the company's having trouble uh, getting them. That would be an out-of-pocket expense, as most insurance companies are not covering the cost of the rapid test. But the lab that we're partnering with um, has a 24-hour turnaround time once they receive the samples. So the PCR test comes back uh, within a day or two. So that, that will be welcome, I think, by the community. That's underway again Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays from 10 to 6 at the former CDCH off 110 Stephen Hands Path. That's great. Uh, additionally, um, we just got word uh, just a short time just before the show started that um, our temporary restraining order against the expansion of Sand Highway Mines off Middle Highway has been granted. Uh, we, we brought this action against the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for issuing a permit to expand that mine 110 feet below the level of groundwater in a critical water area. Uh, we have very serious concerns about potential contamination of groundwater. Uh, there are two Suffolk County Water Authority wells not too distant from this location. And by allowing them under that permit to mine down to 110 feet below groundwater, they'd be creating an artificial six acre lake. It's <clears throat> inconsistent with the town zoning. This is a pre existing non conforming sand mine within a residential neighborhood. Uh, so we're very gratified to see that the court agreed. I had filed an affidavit along with our building inspector and uh, county hydrologist uh, about uh, our concerns. And uh, so we're very happy to see that this has uh, taken place. And I know the neighboring residents will be very happy with this determination. Awesome. I mean, that sounds like, honestly, I don't understand half of that, but it sounds really good that you want. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, uh, protecting our groundwater is critically important. We live on Long Island over a source, sole, sole source aquifer. Um, Say that 10 times yeah, fast. Sole source aquifer. So, yeah, <laughs> it, you, you get the message. Um, yeah. You know, basically, we live on top of the water we drink. So it's critically important that we are careful about how we use the land around and on top of our drinking water. Um, so this is, I think another victory in protecting our groundwater or drinking water from potential negative impacts. Um, you know, without water, uh, we can't survive. And we, we, you know, are finding around the world, clean drinking water is becoming more and more scarce. So we need to make sure that we do whatever we can to protect ours. Awesome. I'm all about that. I mean, no one's going to fight you on that one. Uh, any other announcements that you have? Um, you know, nothing really comes to mind at the moment. Um, you know, we have seen, we've been monitoring, going back to COVID, we've been monitoring the uh, positivity rate within the town. As you know, we went back to remote meetings when the local positivity got above 10%. It, uh, it remained at 10% between September 9th and 13th. It actually went up to 14% in Montauk and 12% in East Hampton between the 14th and the 19th. The most recent um, report I have is for a 9% positivity rate uh, in East Hampton and 11% in Montauk. So hopefully this trend will continue and that we're on the down slope. Um, you know, there are still a number of people that are getting COVID and sick within our community. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that when the county posts their positivity numbers, um, it's based on 
zip code of the primary residence of the person being tested. And as we know, uh, uh, there are many, many people within the town of East Hampton whose primary residence may be listed by zip code in New York City or some other state or in some cases other countries. Um, so I think it's been very important for us to have local on the ground reporting to be able to monitor the positivity infection rates within the township. Uh, again, this new testing site in Wayne Scott will also help us with that. Um, we'll have the town will have access to uh, the daily reports instead of where just can reports. I don't mean to interrupt, but where can the public? Is there anywhere the public can receive those local numbers? So uh, I've been posting them and talking about them um, in this at this show and also at the town board meetings. Um, I believe we've had them up online as well. Uh, I know we did uh, earlier in the pandemic, and I can check to make sure that those are getting posted. But I think, you know, when people have said, you know, the positivity rate's pretty low in Suffolk County, you know, 3 4%, why aren't you having in-person meetings? Um, you know, I think the full picture is that the positivity rate is still pretty high within the community. And uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that I'll, I'll so, be you know, we've been honest. trying to amplify that message and help people yeah. understand that the way the county reports is based on, uh, you know, the address, primary residence address. Uh, so that kind of skews the numbers, I think. OK, well, it is going down. So that's the good news from. Uh, yeah, we hope that keeps going. I mean, we really want to be done with this. I'd, I'd yeah. love to be able to get back to in-person meetings and in-person embed events. Uh, but at this point, you know, we're going to continue to monitor that uh, to try to make sure that the public remains safe and that we're not just, you know, having, uh, you know, continued transmission of this disease. Again, if you're not vaccinated, there are plenty of opportunities for you to get vaccinated at your local pharmacy or at uh Parish Hall in Southampton through the hospital. Third shots are becoming available to those who have had their second shot at least six months prior and who are over 65, as well as uh, some individuals who have underlying immunocompromised uh, systems are eligible. I am pursuing uh, possibly giving third vaccinations at the Center for Humanity in Wayne Scott off Stephen Hans Path, where we initially gave the vaccine. So stay tuned on that. Cool. And uh, obviously, uh, this is just a uh, reminder to also get a flu shot. It, it is the fall. It is flu season is coming up. And uh, I, I recommend everybody go and get their flu shot as well. That's just a uh, local reminder, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, thank you for that, Matt. You're absolutely right. You know, we had uh, very almost non-existent flu uh, last year. Everybody was wearing masks. It didn't really have much opportunity to spread. But since people have been vaccinated and are out and about uh, more, I think that's great advice. Yeah. And uh, before we end here, I do want to give a shout out to your son, Tom, who I went to school with. He had a great film. I believe it was called The Glass at the yes. East Hampton Film Festival. Um, so I want to give a shout out to uh, your son, Tom. Yeah, thanks. We're very excited about that. He uh, he wrote, directed and produced that movie. It's a 20 minute short it was accepted by the Hamptons International Film Festival and is being viewed. Uh, it's being shown on on Sunday. Yeah, it's ab I I've I went on the website. It looks absolutely fantastic. Um, so I do I do want to put that out there. That that is a great achievement by a local. Yeah, thank and, you, Matt. He's of course. As well. <laughs> and uh, if if there's nothing else, I guess we'll wrap it up. And uh, I won't see you next week because it's Columbus Day, I believe. Right. Yeah. So I'll see you on the 18th of October. Look forward to it. Awesome. Have a Thank great week, so everybody. Stay safe and be well, everyone. Yes. Have a great week, everybody.